You've heard that anarchism is a series, a body of theory, which emerged after the French Revolution and was gradually systematized by theorists such as Proudhon in France, Mikhail Bakunin from everywhere, since he had no special locale, although he originally came from Russia, Peter Kuropotkin, who also came from everywhere, although originally from France, and which have influenced our intellectual tradition enormously, whether we call them anarchists or not. I think of the fact, for example, that Peter Kuropotkin's mutual aid is now literally part of our cultural legacy. Also, such masterful studies, I might add here, as fields, factories, and workshops, a work that has yet to appear in paperback circulation that represents a truly ecological point of view before the word ecology became popular. Namely, the concept of a society that lived in harmony with nature, that was decentralized, and that was scaled to human dimensions, so that people would understand the society in which they lived, and would be able to control directly the society in which they lived. In contrast to a society that today has become so gigantic that its cities are really immense nations and its nations contain populations and bureaucratic structures that are beyond the comprehension of even those who run them. And yet I would like to go further, perhaps than this, the most sophisticated notion that exists about anarchism today. And to try to describe anarchism in much broader historical and human terms. And I would urge you not to have any qualms about the word anarchism. If you like, call it mutualism. And there were anarchists who called themselves mutualists. Or call it in the spirit of Charles Fourier, Harmonian. And call the new society the new harmony, if you like. Words do not mean a thing here. What counts more than anything else is the concept, the concept that anarchism projects of humanity, and even more important than the concept, the human spirit, that anarchism or libertarianism or mutualism or whatever you choose to call it, reflects. To understand anarchism is to understand ourselves and understand our history and understand our future. Because we as human beings emerged out of animality in social forms that can only be described as anarchy. These social forms going back thousands of years, millions of years, consisted of small kinship groups, extended families, which gradually interlinked into clans and then into tribes and even tribal federations in which, quite probably, and all the evidence I think points to it, there were no systems of professional coercion that were imposed upon the people who made up the community. What you had in these organic societies were direct face-to-face -face relationships between parents and children, <clears throat> in a sense, to use our own freaked out language, brothers and sisters, in which no institutions of coercion existed, and in which people were organized primarily around their functions, and even status was largely function. These communities existed, if not in harmonious relationships between each other, they certainly existed to a very great extent in harmony within the community itself. There was no real material basis for domination because the amount of work that people engaged in did not produce enough surpluses for some privileged caste to cream off and live at the expense of other people's labor. In these harmonious and organic societies out of which our humanity itself was created, in which if you want to speak of anything that remotely resembles a human nature, people viewed each other as subjects, not as objects. 
and they viewed the natural world not as an agglomeration of things to be exploited, to be dominated, to be seized upon. They viewed the natural world even as subject, so that when you went out to hunt, you had first to go through the ceremonies of propitiation, in which you invited the collaboration of the hunted animal into your hunt. And its very integrity and selfhood was respected even though it was to be killed and used for food or used for garments. And even after that, you went through the ceremonialism, again of propitiation, so that again you invited the ascent of the animal that you had hunted into the hunt and into the use of the animal. This is an attitude toward nature which reflects an attitude toward people. And you may regard it as mystical, which it surely was, no animal consented, and there was no animal spirit that had to be propitiated, and there was no science to tell us about these facts, but nonetheless what I'm talking about is an attitude toward nature that reflected an attitude toward people. Dorothy Lee, in a superb book, L.E.E., -E, called Freedom and Culture, which explores this mentality, points out that the very language structure of these types of communities was completely free of hierarchy and domination. There were no hierarchies, and the language was incapable of expressing hierarchy and domination. That's how deep-seated it was. That's how completely it permeated the unconsciousness, not simply the consciousness, of those who are in these communities. And I feel it is important to explore this because we must return to these attitudes, as I will try to show. In this, as it were, what Marcuse calls Orphic attitude, as distinguished from our Promethean attitude of domination. In this attitude, a Wintu Indian mother, as Dorothy Lee points out, had no way of saying that I take my child and bring it into the shade. The expression and the syntax demanded this is that I go with my child into the shade. I do not take my child, appropriate my child, pick it up and put it in the shade. I go with my child into the shade. The concept of taking and in a sense implicitly of coercing the child without consulting it as it were and bringing it into the shade irrespective of what its will may be could not be expressed in the language. That's how deep-seated this subject-to-subject, -subject, that I-thou relationship, as against that I-it relationship, permeated the very unconsciousness of this early community. A Wintu chief did not rule his people. A Wintu chief stood by his people. And in addition, a Wintu chief, as most of the chiefs, perhaps of that period, and to a great extent even today, in many so-called primitive communities, had no powers of rule anyway. Such a chief was a consultant, the wisest man, and in a sense fitted not so much into a political fabric of domination and hierarchy, but into a division of labor, in which wisdom was one element of that division of labor, and in which the Wintu chief was consulted for decisions and for judgments which could not be imposed on the community. This attitude went so far as Dorothy Lee points out, and she adduces dozens of examples from the Hopi Indians, from other types of communities, even from the Plains Indians who were so relatively neurotic and represented, incidentally, a reconstitution of tribal life owing to the development, the appearance of the horse. She points out that this attitude went so far that a winter warrior or hunter did not own bows and arrows, he too, like the chief, stood by his bows and arrows. So that there was no designation and there was no language and there was no syntax for possession as well as domination. And it is out of that mutualistic type of community that human beings could have arrived at their humanity, that they could have emerged out of their animality. And before we begin to speak of human nature, I would beg you to remember 
that there are millions upon millions of years of so-called human nature, in which human beings emerge out of animality with a consciousness fundamentally different from the one we have today, and to which we may repair for standards and for values fruitfully today, at a point when our present type of consciousness may well tear down this planet, not to speak of destroying us by the millions. It was the breakup of this community, which may have existed for millions upon millions of years, that brought us to the so-called attainments in technology and to the so-called attainments in culture that we celebrate through the words of either Monsieur Trudeau or others. That social group. That community was split, it was divided. Human beings for the first time in the long career of humanity were turned into means of production. Just as the tool that were being used, just as the weapons that were being used in prior times, human beings were turned into means of production. They became tools, their muscles became tools, their eyes became tools that were manipulated socially, even physically, by an increasingly privileged minority in society that could now live off their labor because technology itself was beginning to produce marginal surplus. So that you had a still further division, along with the division between communal and property society, a still further fracturing in the unity of the early community. And with that, changes in the attitude, with that, changes in the syntax, with that, changes in the unconscious, I'm not speaking of the conscious apparatus of man, the unconscious apparatus of humanity, so that people began to identify human nature with domination, and people began to identify society with hierarchy. Hierarchy now became part of the unconscious apparatus of humanity so that people began to organize experience hierarchy. Instead of like the Wintu Indian, taking, going with their children into the shade, they now took their children into the shade. And when we speak of art today, we speak of the mastery of our materials. We speak of the fact that we have to dominate our subject. We speak of the fact that this thing is inferior and that is superior. We never see it for what it is. Where these earlier people saw differentiation and diversity in terms of a mutualistic harmony, all being parts of a tremendous whole in which they, as human beings, shared in the cosmos, man not being on the top of the biotic pyramid or lording over all that flies, all that crawls, all that swims, to use biblical language. Now, for the first time, diversity was organized into hierarchy. And by every shade and nuance, by every ethnic characteristic, by every intellectual characteristic, increasingly experience was hierarchalized until we have reached that point today, where our language betrays this unconscious way in which we focus phenomena of any kind. Chairs, tables, people, name it. All around. We think hierarchically. Inferior and superior are the basic elements of our vocabulary, however much they are refracted through other metaphors and other words. And this marked a great departure, for it not only split woman from man, and it not only it split man from man into social classes, but it went further. It split town from country, producing a monumental historical antagonism of which we are paying an enormous price today in the fact that we are literally urbanizing the countryside, not simply with houses, but with the way in which we deal with the natural world in the country. And it did something that was very fundamental. It not only divided society, it divided society from the state. The state began to emerge. And the state began to emerge as the professional apparatus of coercion. The institutionally organized system of professional violence in which a portion of humanity 
call it an army, a police force, a bureaucracy, a monarchy, parliamentarians, whatever you wish, presidents and kings, were increasingly separated from the community, from this unified community which was now disintegrating, and as a professional system organized, managed society. And managed society, and I wish to emphasize this, by reworking through the socialization process of the young, the very unconscious apparatus of the individual. And it created not only this hierarchical mentality, this framework within which we receive all forms of experience, it made the individual be it oppressor or oppressed, fall within this hierarchically men hierarchy mentally, so that people began to think of society and the state as congruency. How could you have a society without a state? Not the idea that for millions of years people lived without the state, but that the state and society are congruent. That society is the state, that the state is society, and you get it in pronunciamentum pronunciamentals of the kind that you hear by heads of state and by journalists. And with that, these identifications, we became paralyzed mentally, not merely in terms of our unconscious. We can daydream with consciousness. I mean, not merely in terms of our consciousness. We can daydream with our consciousness. We can sit in classrooms, or we can sit in workshops, or work in workshops, or we can walk through the street and daydream about our sovereignty, about our freedom, what we would like to do with life without any authority over us. Where we can fall asleep in that twilight zone like Finnegan in Joyce's novel and wander and meander through all types of liberties and licenses if you like, where we are free. But it was in the unconscious material that this type of society began to socialize human beings, that it began to tear them away from what amounted their humanity. And then finally, the ultimate split took place, the self-alienation of the human being, herself or himself. The self-alienation of the human being in the sense that we began to divide mental work from physical work, to regard mental work as prestigious, physical work as something to be disdained and to be avoided. Our sense of creativity was organized into the division of labor, so that our human resources to create, those libidinal urges to produce new forms, to create new forms, all of this was taken and organized around the industrial system and the factories, so that we became truncated human beings, like Charlie Chaplin in the movie Modern Times, where he stands at the assembly line and can do only one thing, this. And when he leaves the assembly line, he can only walk around like that until his musculature has to rearrange itself, find its humanity, his back has to straighten up, and suddenly he looks upon days upon the world. So that we divided mental labor from physical labor, as well as dividing man and man, as well as dividing men and women, and as well as dividing community and state, town and country. Finally, the human being was divided. Now, I don't want to pretend that this didn't do something, that it was all nothing but evil. Evil it was. But it did something. The early human beings were, in a sense, quote, dominated by nature, to use the only language. Let's say that they couldn't, they didn't have the free play with the natural world that we have today, for better or for worse. You can have it both ways, by the way. And they began to emancipate themselves at the expense of their own domination. Their domination began to lead over the historical long run to at least the preconditions for a greater freedom than humanity had ever known before. And this was in the form of the development of their technology. Living in equilibrium with the natural world millions of years ago, they lived in a world of scarcity and insecurity. And it would be difficult to understand shamanism, it would be difficult to understand so-called primitive religion, it would be difficult to understand the fears and anxieties that beleaguered early primitive society without recognizing that the human beings of that distant, remote period lived in insecurity. They literally did not know whether they would survive a season, whether when the winters came, they would have enough to eat. 
And this too orchestrated their mentality and their unconscious with a demonology and a mystification of the world that we can do without to a great extent today. So that you did have, as a result of this system of domination, the gradual development of technology. And with it, you had also the gradual development of new conceptions of freedom, which would erupt in periods of social breakdown, such as the breakdown of the Roman Empire, such as the breakdown of the medieval world, and such as the breakdown of our own time today, in wild, liberty-loving, generous conceptions of freedom, which historians have quite rightly called anarchist, and which go back in time to the struggles of the Indians against the whites, which go back because, mind you, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were anarchists. They didn't know the word, they never heard of it. But they were defending a community against a state. And they were defending an organic community against a marketplace, which brought them whiskey and brought them guns and brought them the Bible. All three being the great components of colonizing civilization. And if you wish, the early Christians were anarchists. And they reflected in their anarchism what they were fighting against. The second coming of Christ, which for the early Christians would mean a land of milk and honey, a restoration of peace and harmony in which lion and lamb would lie down beside each other, in which the secular monarchies would be wiped out, eliminated or converted, if you like, and in which human beings would all be free all of these conceptions are completely anarchist, and in their form of anarchism, in their theoretical structure, as it were, or in their religious structure, reflected the form of societies or forms of domination that they were fighting against, such as slave systems of domination. And lastly, until we come to our own time, and we must keep this in perspective, because we have to transcend the narrow definitions of anarchism and see where we are going today. You lastly had, with the emergence of the factory system, and with the emergence of workers in factories organizing into trade unions, the anarcho-syndicalist concept of anarchism, in which the workers themselves would take control of the factories, building trade unions that could take this control over inside the capitalist structure, and then through a general strike, utilizing the institutions of their syndicalist unions, literally take over the whole society and run them from below through workers' committees in the factory, with decisions being made at the base of the society and the top of the society coordinating these decisions. And this form of structure is no state, because here everybody runs society, not a group of professionals. And the principles involved in running society are deeply democratic and voluntaristic. And people now begin to take control over their everyday lives in the course of taking control over the society. But all of these forms of anarchism reflected in their struggles, in what they opposed, in the affirmative statements that they made to the societies that they were then opposing, all down the chain of history, as it were. They all reflected a partial movement in which gradually human beings were beginning to at least emerge out of an iron scarcity that always raised the problems of privilege. Privilege was born of the fact that there is enough to go around if all work for a few who don't work to cream off the means of life. They will administer the society. But if there is enough to go around for all, if which in fact the surpluses are monumental, as it has now begun to develop in the modern world, at least in the first world, then privilege itself becomes increasingly meaningless. It's as though everybody became a state official, therefore the state dissolved. It's as though everybody had access to the means of life and it no longer made any difference whether differentials existed in the means of life. And as technology in this world of quotes evil, began to grow as a result of this evil, as a result of the dynamism introduced by class and pack, as a result of the precisely the attempt to master the natural world and master human beings in doing so, technology began to advance.
And with the Industrial Revolution, the promise was first opened up that enough would exist for all, that this now lay on the horizon of society. And now we have reached that point of social development, where more than enough can exist in the world. That is the point that we have reached. And in reaching that point, privilege has now become totally irrational. Hierarchy has become totally irrational. And scarcity today has to be planned so that most of the plans that are made up in the United States, and I suspect to a great degree in Canada, not to speak of Western Europe, are plans designed to provide work for people who shouldn't even be working. We have reached that insanity. We have reached the insanity where a planned economy in the Western world means planning, scarcity, so that a vast portion of the technology can be devoted, must be devoted, to means of destruction, not even means of production and domination, but literally means of destruction, in the form of a vast arms economy, in the form of a vast nuclear bomb apparatus, rockets, planes, you name it. Not merely as instruments in engaged, engaging in a cold war that has now become very lukewarm, but also as means, and above all perhaps as means, of diverting the enormous resources of this technology so that means of waste can be produced and wasteful jobs created, wasteful professions, wasteful occupations, a wasteful way of life that is wasteful not only of nature but of the human spirit. And here we have come to a key point that I have to emphasize. And that is that all these forms and institutions the patriarchal family, the class society, the property system, the state apparatus, and even the city itself, for anyone who has seen the cities of the United States particularly, and those of Western Europe, have now reached their historical limits. They no longer even in evil perform the functions that they traditionally perform. They no longer even act as stabilizing factors and elements in the society. Right now, the patriarchal family is not a source of order, however coercive. It is a source literally of disorder. The system cannot even assimilate. Having shriveled from the extended family to the nuclear family, finally down to the pompous male, it sits there, you know what I mean, presiding over history and invoking the legacy of religion, of authority, and finally of violence. It doesn't even make the bourgeois machinery work. And they themselves have to sit around with clinic, family clinics, child adjustment clinics, a whole system of psychology that has to be applied psychology to deal with this dinosaur of his take it further the class structure today is now making the economy unworkable the factory hierarchy is beginning to produce massive sabotage so that however well or ill designed the car may be it may collapse not merely because it has been engineered for obsolescence but because there's a monkey wrench lying somewhere in the gas tank. And this has become a massive social liability on the system which goes now into the billions of dollars in the United States. And in terms of the property system leads to one ripoff after another. They are now in New York City slowly staffing every single major store with a small army. With devices and a whole industry has emerged to validate the property system in the midst of this sick abundance with a police system that sits around and scrutinizes and devices and television cameras and I venture to say in time there will be more television cameras in stores than there are any place else to find out who is taking what. And rightly so. And the worst thing that they find is that it is not only the freaks who are coming in and not only the middle class ladies with their chauffeurs behind them carrying the basket 
<laughs> horrors of horrors, and it's within the bureaucracy itself. And even the gods are stealing. <laughs> and this is no joke. This is a reality. So that the lie detector and the guy who interprets the lie detector will have to be lie detected. <laughs> so that the property system has literally become a theme. And already they sit around with vagaries about how they can go around and give everyone possibly a guaranteed annual income or somehow provide, give it away, you know, in such a fashion to coupon through God knows how. So that we'll still seem to have the structure of scarcity so that people will be still buyers and sellers, which is what the human being has been reduced to in the system. All of this, at least to maintain the fabric, at least to maintain the fabric of a hierarchy. And this is what the planning is. This is what they plan. We have reached a point where all of these split now, whatever they did for society, have now become equal. They have now reached their historical limit. And most significantly of all, not only do these splits threaten to undermine civilization by producing a barbarism, urban, nuclear, or whatever you choose, or human and spirit, but on top of that, these splits threaten to destroy the natural world itself. Because again, to return to what I started, the Promethean spirit of domination the atomization of human beings and their reduction into objects and the reduction of the natural world itself into an object to be dominated, to be exploited, to be literally ransacked for the sake of production, an insensate, mindless production defined exclusively by profit and defined exclusively by the exchange relationship between buyers and sellers to which the whole human spirit has been reduced to threatens to undermine the natural world itself. And what I'm getting at here is that this system is not only harmful because it produces pollutants, but because it is a parasite on the natural world. It is a pollutant that must devastate the whole natural world if it is permitted to continue its present development. But that present development is its very law of life. Production for the sake of production, it makes no difference what you can do, as long as you can sell it. And since you've got so much to sell, you have to create consumption for the sake of consumption. Which means that if you don't consume, you are not a good city. Not only that, your psyche has to be organized to find relief from this horror in buying a new dress or buying a new pair of trousers or buying a new car or buying a new home or refurnishing your home or adding three television sets to four television sets and three cars to two cars if you're only stuck with two cars. And if you can get a summer home and an autumn home and a spring home, that'll settle it for them. <laughs> and this is inherent in the system. It is not advertising. Advertising is merely the expression of a law of life, a dialectic of the social system. The flip has to be healed, and that is what anarchism is. Anarchism is about the healing of these splits, and again, the restoration of a human community. Not going back to the past, the way the professors have been saying. Not ripping ourselves of technology, again, the way the professors and academics describe anarchism. That is arrant nonsense. Arrant nonsense. Bakunin and Kuropotkin, even in the 19th century, not to speak of anarchists now at the close of the 20th century, recognized that technology could be turned from a means of domination into a means of liberation. That is nonsense that anarchists want to go back to the peasant village, that they want to go back to Horticulture and simply, you know what I mean, the dibbling stick together. That is rubbish. What anarchists do, sir, and this applies to our time more than anything else, is that the splits have to be healed and that society now has to be turned into free communities based on all that is ecologically viable in this technology and also on a highly sophisticated technology 
that can be used on a small scale, that can be used to integrate the resources of a community into a kind of eco-community, an eco-technology that will begin to utilize in patterns the energy resources of the sun and wind as well as fossil fuels so that you can have a balanced, harmonious, ecological type of energy system tailored to a community located within a region or an ecosystem, if you like, to use ecological language, that does not act as a cancer on the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. That is what anarchists are today advocating. They claim today, and rightly, that all the institutions that in evil carried us through a civilized form of barbarism have now to be stripped away and a true human type of relationship is to be. This would entail the decentralization of the cities, which are in their own sense not decentralizing but caving in. This would entail human relationships on the basis of personality, not on the basis of inferiority and superiority, allowing for the diverse characters of human qualities and individual qualities, integrating into a free community, which would directly, not merely through representatives, directly manage society. We go back again to the Hellenic ideal on the basis of a new technology and on the basis of a new body of knowledge and a long history of a new type of polis which no longer exists in contradiction to the country, which now consists of the assembly of free individuals whose working time has been reduced by technology so that they can now literally appropriate the management of society in councils and in assemblies and in communities tailored in terms of size and in terms of technology and with new technology, not going back to the bow and arrow, with new technologies that are now perverted and whose development is today arrested, such as solar power and wind. To new technologies that will harmonize humanity's relationship with the natural. A new psychic and personal relationship, as well as a new integration of free personalities which will overcome the, overcome the splits between mind and labor, between conscious and unconscious. And finally, the elimination of all those institutions of hierarchy and the restoration again of a new animism, a new way of looking at experience, an orphic way, to use Marcuse's language, that will restore again that long legacy in the human experience, the I-thou relationship instead of the I-it relationship. And this today is taking place unconsciously, no matter what I have to say or any other anarchist. Intuitively today, millions of people are beginning to rebel in their very gut and in the forms of the counterculture for all its limitations, perversions, one-sidedness, and all the criticisms you've heard. Nonetheless, intuitively, reflecting the tension between the exhaustion of what is the exhaustion of all the institutions that make up what is today and what could be in the form of a free utopian society. What I describe to you is almost a hereditary vision of utopia that was once dismissed merely as utopia and dismissed merely as vision. The Industrial Revolution made that vision increasingly possible. And that vision was increasingly spelled out in the form of socialism and Marxism and even anarchism. Our own time has now made it necessary. We have now passed from the realm of vision and the realm of possibility into the realm of necessity. The dictates of ecology itself impel us to try to actualize that vision at the peril of either destroying society or destroying the whole world the whole world of life, with the monstrous devices we have to have. And if the French student could say, be practical, do the impossible, I would add to this, if we don't do the impossible, we will wind up with the unthinkable.
After his talk, several questions were asked in the short time left for discussion when we recorded his speech. The first questioner suggested that early human society was not as ideal as Mr. Bookchin had pictured it. Wasn't there hierarchy in primitive society? As we can see hierarchy working today in primitive societies that still exist, for example in Africa. Are there not native aggressive tendencies in man that inevitably lead to the domination of man by man? I would answer that by saying, one, I never said that these societies, any so-called primitive societies, were idyllic. Contrary, I said that they were riddled with demonology, shamanism, anxieties. Now we get the hierarchy, which is a separate matter. And also, finally, surely they were, quote, dominated by nature. If you have to fight, say, in the very earliest period, say the two tigers, for all we know, and the wild beasts are your problem before you get to any other problems, you don't have an idyllic society, of course. Now the question of hierarchy is another matter, and I agree with you that there are aggressive impulses, particularly in males, and that has been due to a long evolution. And there is a certain biologism involved in that, but that can be tamed, believe me. And if that is tamed, is more important. I would add one more thing to that. First, Africa is not an example of idyllic or even primitive societies. The African societies we regard as primitive because we see Africans in very highly structured and very advanced empires. In empires, in loin cloth, so we assume that because of that, that they are simple primitive people. That is untrue. Africa as a continent has been the arena, no less than Europe and no less than the Near East, of extremely complex societies which emerged out of early clan groupings and finally led to immense empires as these things go. Even pastoral peoples who invaded peasant peoples as they did in the Near East back in Mesopotamia, so too in Africa you had the same invasions, you had the same hierarchies, you had a recapitulation in Africa, in black Africa, not to speak of North Africa, you had a recapitulation of the history of humanity. So it, is, it would be wrong even to adduce the continent as an example. The thing that I would be concerned about are the aggressive impulses in humanity, and I don't think we should sidestep that. Human beings went through a vast period of hunting. A hunting phase which was not simply a culture, but which conditioned them as human beings, biologically, anatomically. We today have bipedal gait, and an upright gait, partly because we were out on the savannas many, many years ago, the African savannas. We were out there, and we had the advantage through our erect posture, not simply of carrying tools and carrying food, great advantage, especially since we were flesh eaters, but also of peering over the savannah grass. So that is at least one theory. You can accept it or reject it. It is now pretty popular. So we were conditioned into a biology for hunting and for killing. And these impulses may be with us today. I'm not going to deny that. The question now is whether or not we can afford to have them any longer and whether we can re-socialize humanity into other types of behavior. That has been done historically. This is not something that we have to deliver merely to the hands of psychologists and endocrinologists to deal with the problem. That has been done historically. I have visited Pueblo Indian, and I have visited Hopi community, and I speak not simply from a learned knowledge, and I can tell you that Hopi, which means the people of peace, were marked, at least by artifacts that suggested a very Pacific type, so that even that turbulent male hunter, who is capable of a physical, shall we say, equipment, or behaving, if not aggressively, at least in great spurts of energy, can be gently deflected and utilize that good energy for much more harmonious and creative purpose. So the problem is there, but the problem has been solved in the past. It is not that I have to project this into a utopia to describe to you people such as the Hopi and such as the Pueblo Indians and such as highly pacific and harmonious peasant civilizations that actually did achieve, at least in their psychic structure, that orphic personality that I think must exist for the future if there's going to be a future. We all have to do the re-socializing. That's what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that we are discussing how we can remake ourselves, not only remake society. I would never leave that dimension outside the picture. Life in North America is not very pleasant, as Murray sees it. 
We have material comforts, but there is spiritual discontent. And there doesn't seem to be any mass movement aroused for change. Many people think that the guidelines for political action can be seen in some of the popular movements of Asia and Africa. Does the so-called third world offer a model of change for us? There, is, there was a myth abroad, which is now waning a great deal, that although our classical proletariat at home no longer is as revolutionary as Marx anticipated it would become, and has not been for a very, very long time, and for many reasons, psychological as well as just strictly economic, the work ethic, obedience to the factory hierarchy, the basic character structure of the working class, which I personally know very well, having come out of that class, I would say in addition to that, there was a redeeming theory that if our working class at home was not doing what we expected it to do, at least the third world would be that proletariat for us. This myth of the third world acting as our working class is a dangerous myth, first because of the kind of tactics it produces in Weatherman, and secondly because it is not even based on objective reality. The United States can control the world even if it means destroying the world. And the United States is not a paper tiger. On the contrary, it's a real tiger. The United States has amassed, together with Russia, an armamentorium that can literally pull down the planet. And if its back is up against the wall, as Hitler's back was up against the wall in 1945, when he was prepared to have his Gottesdamerung, you know, all of the guards in Wagnerian style with music and vast crescendos behind, and yes, this is a great theme of capitalism, the Gata Damarum, the fall of the gods, the fall and burning of Valhalla. That is merely the Teutonic form. America today has a neo-bureaucratic form called the Land Corporation. <laughs> we grow and times change. This form of power must not be ignored, and with it, if you wish to call it a revolutionary strategy, has to be formulated that can do. You do not have in the third world a full period. You in fact have a people that are fighting still, taking up the tasks of the traditional bourgeois revolution. That is national freedom. That's not a simple socialist or anarchist demand. Socialist demands and anarchist demands go beyond the nation. The right to build their own technologies and develop industrially. These are the tasks of capitalism. The last question. Did we have to go through the stage of capitalism to reach the point where the anarchy Mr. Bookchin talks about is possible? Was the history of exploitation and aggression we have gone through necessary to open our eyes to what a different world we might have? Is technology alone the sole and sufficient reason that a new vision of society is possible? Well, I never said that technology is the sufficient reason for getting there, you know, and necessary. What I did say is that technology has now at once made it possible. Technology in the hands of a market and in the hands of these institutions has now turned technology from means of production into means of not simply domination, but means of destruction. That's what I said. And this is an entirely different type of emphasis. I submit now that you have an institutional structure and you have a psychology that goes with it, that owing to the development of technology, in itself a barbarous body of institutions and a barbarous psychology in life, but which through the cunning of history, to use Hegel's term, nonetheless in evil managed to pull man, humanity I should say, out of the domination, the domination, again domination, in quotation. This technology now has to be deployed humanistically, which means that new institutions, new psyches, new relationships have to be established. Or else the old ones... You see, what I'm getting at is that the tiger has developed big teeth. Bigger teeth than we ever expect. That doesn't mean that the tiger is defined by its teeth. The tiger is the tiger. It was clawing, it was tearing apart for five, ten thousand years, perhaps. But now the tiger has immense teeth and immense claws. And if that tiger is not separated from its teeth and claws, and the tiger, shall we say, pacifically, harmoniously, as gently as we can, eliminated, 
then we're in a bad way. And that is the actual relationship, to use a kind of metaphor, as it were, or to use, you know what I mean, an analogy more properly that I'm referring as to whether the market economy is what, a precondition for freedom? Well, that belongs to an interesting realm of speculation that I can't get into, except that the market economy is, in a sense, with us and behind us already. Whether capitalism had to follow that destiny, that it became one of the most vicious systems in history, is another question. And that takes us back to when Columbus discovered America, the expansion of the Atlantic market, it's a big thing. So there's no point in quite going into that. But strategy, I should say, as a perspective, anarchism does not seek the seizure of power. Anarchism does not advance the notion that you have to seize power. Anarchism calls for the dissolution of power. When every individual has power over her or his everyday life, power now becomes so ubiquitous that it ceases to be power as separated from society in the form of a state, in the form of a professional bureaucracy, in the form of armies, in the form of police corps, and in the form of the bureaucrats who staff all these institutions. To give power over everyday life and every minute of life, to make every moment of life marvelous, or as marvelous as we can make it, that type of power is the end of power. And it is this that we have to aim for today. I'm not suggesting an eon of reform, but I am saying this, an enlightenment is going on today. An enlightenment in which people are increasingly developing self-possession, developing self-consciousness, developing new selves, however distorted, developing or seeking for new relationships. And it is percolating through the so-called Western world. And it corresponds in principle to the great French Enlightenment of 1740 to 1789 with rapid changes in consciousness, or potentially rapid changes in consciousness, where one year telescopes 10 years in the tempo at which people learn and change their views. And the massive disengagement that is slowly, intuitively going on, which is summed up in their language by the word incredibility gap. Incredibility is an understatement. If they say yes, everybody knows it's no. Where all the institutions and their legitimacy are now being invalidated. At that particular point, you begin to see a new form of social decay. At that particular point, we will one day, even perhaps without a name, forgetting anarchism or communism or socialism, begin working really with the content and form of what is socially possible, necessary, and necessary, achieve that goal. And at that point, the revolution will be not power against power. It will be, on the contrary, the dissolution of power and the final elimination of even the facade of power in the moment of insurrection. That is the struggle that I would recommend.